are listening to Out of the Box Podcast with Rosie Tran. Out of the Box is sponsored by HugMeTease.com. Spread love, give a hug, HugMeTease.com. Guys, we are now on SoundCloud, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. If you enjoy the podcast, don't forget to go on iTunes, look for Out of the Box Podcast, and leave a positive comment. Positive comments are the number one thing that help out the podcast and bring our numbers up so that other people can find out about the show. I'm here today with a really cool financial blogger. You may have heard of him. His website is called Financial Samurai. Sam, how are you doing? Good. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Good. Um, So some of the listeners don't know about your blog. You started it in 2009 during the financial crisis. Is that right? That's correct. I started it in 2009 just kind of to make sense of all the chaos and to, to kind of try to reach out to other people who were also suffering from the financial crisis. And it's since kind of grown from there to be a pretty well-rounded personal finance site. So were you a financial advisor? I know you worked in finance at Goldman Sachs, but what made you decide to just start? Was it just an outlet at first? or? Yeah, it was just an outlet. I worked at two major um, bulge bracket firms from 1999 to 2012. And so in 2009, so that was basically like a 10-year anniversary in the business. And just writing has, has always been a hobby of mine. You know, Ever since I was a kid, I would, I'd be the guy who would write pen pals um, as a great, <laughs> great schooler. Yeah. I, I lived in Malaysia and as like from first to – no, middle school. Yeah, middle school in Malaysia. And it was fun. And I had all these pen pals from all over the world. And I kept – Kept on writing, and then for my job, I was in uh, institutional equities, sales and trading. So part of my job was to write really interesting, insightful, poignant type of emails to get clients' attention to make sure they kind of open up the email and understand what we're talking about in a specific region. You know, I used to do Asian equities, so it's all about uh, communication, and so that's something I've really loved to do for a very long time. And your writing has really taken off because not only do you blog, but you ended up engineering your own layoff and writing a book about that, which is also available on Financial Samurai. Is that correct? Yeah. So in 2000, let's see, by 2011, um, so I just did this on the down low as a side hustle. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Like I really wasn't supposed to do it, right? Uh, but it's like, you know, freedom of speech. You can write whatever you want. And I never wrote about my company or my clients or anything. It was just personal finance, right? And just kind of personal journal. But after about two, it started making a livable income stream online. In I live in San Francisco, so that was good because I was like, well, okay, if I can survive up just writing, maybe there's like actually a correlation with effort. And I had been working on Wall Street for 13 years at the time. And, you know, the financial crisis hurt everybody's pay. Uh, a lot of people got laid off. And also there was a lack of correlation with effort and performance anymore. I was to be able to see a correlation. If I tried hard, if I did well, I would be rewarded. And if I sucked... I would get nothing, right? <laughs> okay. That's all anybody anybody can ever really ask for, right? And so that wasn't really happening anymore in finance because there's a lot of one department subsidizing another. So instead of complaining, I was like, oh, what if I could uh, negotiate a severance package and that would give me the courage to actually do something on my own? So you were scared to kind of to kind of take the leap even though you were already making money from Financial Samurai? Yeah, because... It's all relative, right? So if you're used to making $100,000 a year and you make zero, uh, or <laughs> okay. then it's going to be kind of scary. If you're used to making like $500,000 a year and suddenly you make $80,000 a year, it's going to be scary too, right? Because you're, you're just used to whatever lifestyle you're accustomed to and change is always the, the biggest stressor in anybody's life, change, right? Changing cities, changing jobs, changing spouses, whatever it is. <laughs> okay. So I've been doing it for so long that uh, I was like, well, give me, a, give, me, give me some kind of runway. And thankfully, I was able to negotiate the severance, which has provided me um, about a six-year runway. I'm still getting paid off. Uh, actually, I actually have another tranche coming in next year in 2017. So that's from 2012. That's great. And it sounds like you're financially independent from your website and your other income streams as well. Yeah. I mean, I had, you know, so that there was income coming in. I, I registered it under a different name, so I wouldn't have any kind of conflict of interest while I was working. And then... Um, I actually built some passive income streams through rental real estate and you know CD investments and dividend investments, right? So I knew that I wouldn't starve, which was like the main thing. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't want to like be on the streets or go rewind back to my 22-year-old self when I was living in the studio <laughs> with another guy, okay. right? So I just my biggest fear was if I 
tried hard and I didn't progress, I would feel a big loser. And luckily, I think there's actually a really strong correlation with effort and reward in an entrepreneurial endeavor. Well, um, you're all about, it seems like Financial Samurai is all about not just financial independence, but independent thinking, which I really like. Because a lot of mainstream financial, personal financial information is not really applicable to what is going on in our current situation. I really try to write from experience. I think money and one's personal finances is a little too important to leave up to pontification. So instead of like reading something about, let's say, home ownership by someone who's never owned a home, I wanted to write about my trials and tribulations of owning a home, being a landlord, buying at the wrong time, buying at a good time, you know, the tax consequences and all that stuff. So I really want everything to be very actionable uh, and also theoretical, but at the end of the day, taking action to be able to improve your personal finances. I mean, financial freedom is, is great in theory and it's something that everybody has their own definition of what financial freedom is like. I just wanted to really kind of tell a story about my own journeys, which can hopefully be applicable to anybody who wants to read and follow along. Not just that, but I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. You know, I, for example, noticed that there's just a lot of constant doom and gloom out there in the financial, personal finance um, oh, yeah? media. Oh, yeah. They're always talking about it's constant income inequality, constant how poor everyone oh. is, constant how horrible everyone's doing. And my husband and I are on the path to financial freedom pretty close to an early retirement. We're in our 30s. And we yeah. make very, very average salaries, and we haven't seen any of this doom and gloom in our personal lives and in the people that we know who all work, you know, regular nine to five jobs. So I think there's a lot of a lot of that. I don't know if you've noticed that or if you're disconnected from the mainstream media, which would probably be healthier. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, so I think you have to understand two things about the mainstream media. One is that uh, the mainstream media doesn't get paid very well. So if you look at the income stream, the salaries of a journalist or editor or producer, it's actually not very high. So when you have a lower income, I mean, you just focus on what you kind of know and what you feel about. So it's actually really natural to kind of rage against, you know, wealthier people or the really rich. It's just that's just the way it is. And then, too, if you look at the media industry, it's being hollowed out because of digital. Right. So mm -hmm. over the past 10 years, you look at the employment chart of the the media, it's just gotten crushed by like 60, 70 percent. You know, even the, the, there's it's almost like every month there's some news media company going under. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, you know, it's not a really happy place to be. So if you're not <laughs> in a happy place, you're going to be really reporting on really negative kind of things. And it's just human nature. It's, you know, you know, you, they talk about, oh, being unbiased in the media or whatever. But it's very, very obvious. The mass media is very biased. And negativity sells sells you know clicks and and advertising and all that so well you can just see the brainwashing in the comment section of financial samurai you know people who are on a higher path to financial freedom will chime in or say something positive or will give their opinion and then um i don't know if it was financial samurai or another finance blog that i read but you know once in a while you'll get someone who's just complaining saying this is impossible i don't know anyone that makes six figures what are you talking you know I don't know if you've right. had that experience in your comment section. You can just see people's belief systems being projected onto the comment section. Of oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Comments are a, really a reflection of someone's individual beliefs. I mean, it really is. So, I mean, I really enjoy all different perspectives of the comment section. But I also like to play around with the comment section as well. I mean, for example, I think there's like this one post I wrote called How to Get Your Parents to Buy You Everything as an Adult. Right? <laughs> okay. You know, and and – and, and it's it's kind of facetious, right? But the reality is is that many adults adults today really rely on their parents for everything from from education to housing to food to clothing to credit card spending and all that. And it's just really not talked about. And I was like, well, let's face this reality and say, hey, you know, one of the tips is maybe you can put a, together a proud PowerPoint presentation and tell your your mom and dad who's worth a good amount of money, hey, why don't you uh, give me your money now instead of after you <laughs> pass away so that I can better utilize it and we can all be happier, right? So it's kind of like you know poking fun at things, but the reality is there are proper ways to to do things that I think will benefit a lot of people. And I, I mean, I want to have fun with my site as well and also have serious topics. Otherwise, it's going to be really, really boring, right? Do you do you get a lot of pushback from people um, 
because of your financial independence point of view in this supposedly, you know, I mean, we can just look at the political arena right now with Donald Trump and Bernie being these Wall Street outsiders having so much traction right now that people just feel like very angry, I think, about the financial sector, or a lot of people do. Do you feel any pushback in in some of your articles? Oh, I think I get pushback all the time. I mean, it's it's reached a steady state where there's about a million pages a, a month now. So it's really it's organic page views too from people who come mostly from search engines like Google. So I, I call the, some of the visitors tourists because they'll you know find an article of mine on search, they'll read it, and then they'll never come back. Um, and I think that's just kind of the way most most uh, things happen in traffic online today. But there's definitely a lot of pushback. But what I found is that you basically attract the people who you want to attract. And if you are a positive thinker, if you always think about abundance instead of scarcity, if you believe that you too deserve to be rich, you know, why is someone getting a $50 million exit package if they drove their public stock price down by 50%? Why are they getting that $50 million package? Why can't you deserve to be rich as well, right? So my site is really, I think I would characterize it really optimistic site that's focused on abundance, that there's more than enough to get around and go around. And I really noticed over the years, I've been online for seven years now, that people who have a scarcity mentality really don't get what other people who have abundance mentality get. I totally agree with you. And I think that, you know, the more open minded I've become about personal finance, the more money has come into my life out of nowhere. So I think, Mm. you know, you really do create opportunities out of nowhere. I think you talked about it on one of your blog entries saying that you stopped advertising your consulting services and you were getting more consulting. Is that, is that right? Oh yeah. It's kind of, it's really <laughs> weird. Like, it so is. I have like, so I, I publish my personal finance consulting page, but I never, I, it's not on anywhere on my site except for like way down below in like a, in my about page at, at the very, very bottom. But I've been like kind of slammed over the past couple of weeks it's literally blown up and I don't know what's going on and I feel bad raising my rates and all that. But yeah, you just have to, I mean, it's, it's such a crazy correlation. And if you think about abundance and you think about how, you know, having a positive mentality, it's, um, there's more money out there in the world than, you know, and more people make way more money than, you know, it's just not as open and talked about as uh, people realize. It is. And I, like I said, you know, the more open-minded I am, about money, it seems the more money just falls into my lap. And, you know, I'm not a huge advocate of, you know, the secret type thinking, but I am an advocate of abundance Mm -hmm. thinking because I'm living proof of it. When I was so worried about money, it's like I couldn't find a penny to save my life. And now that I'm so Mm -hmm. like, don't, not that I don't care, obviously, you know, personal finance is very important to me, but the more open-minded I am about it, it just you know, people call are calling me left and right with offers, and it's a little shocking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people want to hire and work with people who are who have positive thinking and who believe things are going to get better, and that and who believe there's going to be progress, right? And you don't want to hang out or be with Debbie Downers who are just going to bring you down. It's just, but it's very obvious to see who are those people and who are, who are those who really, 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 really want it, right? Yes. I want to talk about a concept, though, that you have blogged about because there is a backlash against wealth right now. Um, And you talk about stealth wealth, (laughs) which I love. I love that. (laughs) I love that name. (laughs) Um, Yeah. How did you come up (laughs) with this idea and what what made you um, start practicing this stealth wealth? I mean, I worked in the evil empire, right? I worked in finance (laughs) and. So like everybody's like, oh, you work on Wall Street, you're evil. And for me, I was like, oh, mom, am I really evil? You know, dad, am I evil? I don't think so. But like I just, I worked really hard in college. Um, I put in a lot of hours. I, you know, I got in at 5.30 a.m. I would leave at 8 o'clock p.m. all the time. And, um, you know, I felt proud to be able to get a job and work hard and, you know, provide liquidity in the capital markets and all that good stuff. But, you know, when the financial crisis hit, it was really a spotlight where, um, you know, Wall Street and finance is bad. And I understand that because it seems like there's like asymmetric uh, bailouts where why do banks get bailed out and, you know, the, the mom and pops and the common people don't get bailed out. Yeah. And so it's, it's an easy and it's an easy thing to focus on, you know, in the media, Wolf of Wall Street, all that stuff. And it's a sexy thing to kind of blame someone. 
And what I realized was that no matter what I did, I mean, I was in Asian equities, right? So I had nothing to do with people not paying their mortgages in the in America, really. It was just like, I had a mortgage and I got negatively affected by someone in my condominium association unit who didn't pay their mortgage, right? So that hurt me in terms of my uh, my wealth and my net worth. But I realized long ago that no matter what I say, it's just the way it is. If someone is wealthier than you, if someone is better looking than you, if someone is uh, more successful and whatever it is, there's going to be a tinge of envy, envy because that's just human nature. So it's way better to be stealth, right? So it's way better to drive a low-key car, to not tell everybody how much you make, to not be flashy in your dress and all that, and just be stealth, but be rich in your own way. Because if you think about like all the people who are you know, driving around in really fancy cars or telling them, oh, I make this, or like name-dropping and all that – I really think there is a inverse correlation with self-esteem and happiness mm-hmm. and that, that kind of activity. You know, so like the people who have to really show off their wealth, it's kind of like, oh, I need to show this off because I need it to validate who I, I am. That's true. That is very true. Um, did you feel any type of – now, you're driving you know, a regular compact car now, but you did have a very expensive vehicle. Did you feel that envy towards you when you were driving a nicer car? Oh, yeah. So – I was like a stupid kid, like, you know, right out of college. The first thing any or many males, I think, who <laughs> get out of college and buy a, and get a job is they want to buy a car, like a nice car. So, I mean, this is like two years after college, but I bought like a G500 Mercedes, which is like the Glendwagon tank. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I rationalized. I didn't even bother. Well, so my rationality was it was it was a $150,000 car in the past because – this company in Santa Fe, New Mexico, had sold import, but then Mercedes bought back those rights, and then they dropped that price to only seventy-two thousand dollars, right? So I was like, "Wow, for seventy-two thousand dollars, it's half price. Let me buy that car." So I bought that car. I was like really excited, and then I remember like driving around, feeling like a total tool, and I would get like hated on by bicyclists in San Francisco <laughs> who would just drive by and be like, you know, like thumbs down on me, right? And then I was like, oh, okay, I understand. And then uh, I wanted to buy this condo in 2003. So I bought the car in 2002. And the, the, the Glenda wagon is six feet, six inches tall. But the condo I wanted to buy had a garage that was only like six feet, four inches tall. So it couldn't fit. You were such a douche. You couldn't even fit in your own garage. <laughs> I know. So I was like, okay, this is stupid. Like, People hate on me, and I can't fit it, my car in my garage. So, and I think it was, you know, more fiscally prudent to buy this condo. So I sold the car. And I went completely 180, and I, um, I bought my mom's uh, 1997 Honda Civic. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was like total reversal. And I was like, oh, I'm driving a Honda Civic now. Nobody hates on me. Um, everything's cool. I can just kind of blend in, and it fits in my garage. So I was like, oh, this is great. Do you feel any happier or less happy with the Honda Civic? Well, so that was many, many iterations ago. Now I have a Honda Fit, which I think is amazing. Okay. And it's kind of like the anti-male macho car, right? <laughs> you know, it's a tiny car, and uh, but I, I love it because it's like parking arbitrage. You can park in literally 25% more spaces in San Francisco because it's so small. Uh-huh. So I thought it was like really funny because like if you can let say impress a lady this is, this is male thinking right so if you can impress a lady with like a honda fit you must be a really impressive person right <laughs> it's like it's, it's like if you roll up in a lamborghini it might not take as much effort so my values have changed as i've gotten older right so i'm i'm 39 this year and it's like oh, i've already been through the flashy phase i think everybody goes through these phases and then they kind of normalize into what they really really appreciate and want and want to spend their money on yeah, and I think that is true. I have a lawyer friend who's very, very wealthy, and he was driving a really nice Beamer, and he actually noticed uh, that he would get more parking tickets, not parking tickets, um, tickets from policemen. Oh, oh, for sure. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I talked to cops, uh, policemen before. They're like, oh yeah, we target those, those, those bastards, you know, you know, whatever it is, you know, we totally go for them. And they're like, because they're like more for the people, right? He's still the same person and still the same amount of wealth, probably more wealthy, and he ended up driving a station wagon that he got because he yeah. had his car in the shop and he noticed nobody bothered him in the station wagon so he just stayed in the station wagon <laughs> yeah that's perfect i had i have a female friend who um i would say she's she's impressed with men with wealth and so she texted me a picture of this guy uh she was going on a date with 
with um and he has like a porsche 911 you know like maybe a 2014 model it's a it's a convertible it's an impressive car it's like probably ninety thousand to a hundred thousand dollars and i was like well that's great but where are you guys gonna make out since he lives at home with his mom you know <laughs> there's no back seat <laughs> and, then, and then she gave me like a frowny ha ha face but it's funny like you know guys girls relationships money that's like a great topic that i like to talk about all the time on my site as well i think that you know the self-wealth idea is wonderful because you know i think that money is a tool and it definitely is a tool to get freedom and independence and other things and image and status and all those other things are the exact wrong reason to use that tool and i think um personal freedom and and experiences are a great reason to use that tool so um have you copyrighted that term (laughs) no i don't think so but i think if you Google self wealth, an article will come up. So that's as good as copyright as I guess. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a top Google, right? <laughs> yeah, if you're top top in the search engines. <laughs> but yeah, it's um, San Francisco is also kind of a little different from maybe other big cities like New York or LA in that it almost is kind of cooler to be more, more stealthy. You know, like you know, like the tech executives who wear the hoodies or they drive the Prius or whatever, you know, maybe it's more like the Leonardo DiCaprio and all I've seen or something. I don't know. Well, um, it's definitely a good way to keep the gold diggers away from you. Yeah. I mean, it's whatever you want. You Again, <laughs> it's like whatever you want to portray is what you will get. Um, another thing I like is that I think that you, like I said, you really focus on some of the real numbers and real um, statistics that are out there because I constantly feel that these median um, net worth numbers and median household income numbers um, that the government puts out are not realistic. First of all, they're all based on uh, income tax returns and other things like that. And everyone lies on their income tax return. I think people at the IRS lie on their income tax return. (laughs) I think some of the numbers that you're posting are a good indicator for people to compare where they should be at as far as goals are concerned. Because it's really hard to find accurate numbers online. And I guess, you know, as a society, we're a little messed up like that, where we like to kind of compare and contrast where we should be um, yeah. as, a, as a healthy amount. Yeah. Because it's... I think it's good to have goals. Well, it's something that's not talked about. And now, because of the internet, personal finance is talked about a little more. But it's all very up in the clouds and, and uh, theory. You know, there's a lot of personal finance Mm. blogs that are just theory and there's no substance where you can grab onto something like you have um, a blog post about the What is it? The average net worth of the above average person. Right. And so it's a goal that. okay, Yeah. It's a goal that people can kind of aim towards and say, hey, am I reaching these numbers instead of some of these blogs or some of these books or personal finance gurus who are kind of, they're very vague. They're like, oh, you should have six to 10 months of expenses in your bank account. Well, how much is, I, I need a number. I'm the kind of person I need a number. <laughs> is that 30,000? Is that okay. 60,000? Well, it depends on your expenses. Well, that doesn't help me. You know, so yeah. you have some practical guidelines where people can kind of grasp onto something instead of these concepts that are just floating around in the air, which a lot of finance bloggers and traditional finance gurus there's a lot of like la la land type of information. Well, again, I write from um, experience, and I'm really active. I mean, as a writer, you have to be introspective um, to think about numbers. So I've really kind of chronicled uh, my journey from you know making three dollars sixty five cents an hour, uh, making egg McMuffins at McDonald's, to making probably close to seven figures in finance, right? And from there, if you can continuously be introspective and write about your thoughts, and also write about how you get there, you will get to these realistic numbers that I think are really hard to argue against because they're real. They're, they're from my experience. Um, if, if you want some quick advice, you know, so I have a newest, newest post called uh, Net Worth Targets by Age, Income, and Work Experience for Financial Freedom Seekers. And the quick skinny is you should think about a net worth target based on your multiple of income so at age 30, I'm recommending, you know, a 2x a multiple of income for your net worth. So if you make 50000 a year, have a $100,000 net worth. At age 40, try to shoot for a 10x multiple. So if you make 50000 a year, have a $500,000 net worth. And the key multiple to take away 
from this chart and post is really a 20x multiple. You can get that by age 60 or by age 40 or whatever it is. But if you can get to 20x your average income that you're happy living off of, I think you can declare yourself financially free, absolutely financially free. Now, you mentioned really quick in your last um, answer that you just gave me that, you know, you chronicle from your McDonald's days to your finance days. Do you think that working at McDonald's and making that three dollars an hour influenced you oh, or, or helped you? Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. It was OK. So my my McDonald's days was, was basically first it was in high school. So, I mean, it's not it's not like, oh, I was an adult. But I was in high school and I was like really embarrassed, like lived in a middle class neighborhood in northern Virginia. And, you know, I had to like get in at 6 a.m., freaking clean, mop everything, you know, flip six Egg McMuffins at once and then <laughs> just stand for like six hours. And then sometimes I would drop the quarter pounder on the floor and you know, I have to decide whether I should throw it away or put it back in the oven. You know, <laughs> funny things like that. And then sometimes I'd have to like go to the like cashier, right? And like say hello and deal with like really hungry customers. And, and uh, it'd be kind of embarrassing because I didn't want any girls that I knew in high school to see that I worked at McDonald's because I don't know why. It was like so stupid, but that's what you think as a high schooler, right? You're just kind of embarrassed about things in general. But that experience really kind of taught me a couple of things. One is I never want to work at McDonald's for an extended period of time in my life ever again. Right. And then two, it's really kind of um, meeting all different types of people. Um, every single one of my colleagues was Hispanic, which was great because I studied Spanish and we practiced Spanish all day long. And it was like really meeting different types of people, hearing their backgrounds, seeing how hard they work and hearing what they do to make money to provide for their family. And so that really kind of crystallize the importance of hard work, appreciating people from all different income streams, and really appreciating what you have. Like, we have so much opportunity here in the States. I grew up in Asia for, for 13, 14 years. And it's like, well, U.S. is like paradise compared to so many developing countries. You know, we have intellectual property rights. We have a government that doesn't confiscate our homes, really. Um, you know, we have free public library, all that stuff, right? And so it's like you really kind of appreciate more of what you have by working really craptastic jobs. And so, <laughs> okay. so it's like when you're like burning the midnight oil, right? When you get into your job at 5.30 a.m. and you're, it's like 10 p.m. and you're like dying, right? And I, 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 that happened to me a lot when I was in New York City. And, you know, I would think back to my time at McDonald's when I, when I would make nothing and then like I'd have a tyrant manager tell me, hey, no speaking Spanish, you know, in front of the customers <laughs> because the customers think you're, or speaking bad about them or something, right? And and everything would be okay. Everything is okay. It's like if you're like the batter who swings two, three bats before you go up to the plate, when you finally swing that, uh, you know, with only one bat, it, like life is kind of easy. So definitely those type of experiences are absolutely, absolutely shape the way I look at things because I have like this really strong philosophy that I try to tell as many people as possible and that is uh, don't fail due to a lack of effort because effort is something you can control, right? You can fail because of exogenous variables, lack of skill or whatever, but don't fail due to a lack of effort because effort requires no skill at all. And do you think that, that those days at McDonald's implanted you with that side hustle or hustle mentality? I think so. Um, so I actually revisited my similar McDonald's days um, last year in 2015. Um, so I started uh, driving for Uber because I'm in San Francisco and Uber's been based here and I wanted to get really kind of the skinny on being a passenger and a driver. And then so since that time, I, you know, I wrote several articles. One article is called um, Spoiled or, or Clueless? Question mark. Try working a minimum wage job <laughs> as an adult, right? Okay. Because it's like time and time again, like I, I hear all these incessant complainings about, oh, I don't make so much. I can't get ahead, whatever. And like, oh, so how, how many hours a week do you work? Oh, um, 40? Like, really? Well, what happened to the other 100 hours you can work a week if you wanted to? Oh, but then work-life balance. So it's like everything is kind of rational. And uh, I think you're really going to want it to achieve. If you really want it, I think you're going to find ways to achieve it, right? And so now with this gig economy, there's really kind of no excuse to, to you know, like drive a car or work at TaskRabbit and as assemble IKEA furniture on the side, whatever it is. The, the excuses for not being able to make money and get ahead, slowly kind of dissipating. 
They are. And there's the sharing economy, you know, I know there's a negative connotation that a lot of people are doing it out of desperation, but there's really this empowering, inspiring side hustle mentality with that. I mean, you can rent out your, you know, extra bedroom on Airbnb and drive Uber and do all these things and kind of string together pretty easily a six figure income. You can make that gap work, right? For sure. If you if you if you're making fifty thousand a year, I am pretty positive you can make an extra twenty thousand dollars a year through the gig economy, and that's a forty percent increase in your pay, which is significant. So yes. And some of the income is you know pretty easy. Uh, we are not doing it any longer, but you know my husband and I were renting a room um, in our home through Airbnb, and it that is also another um, reflector. I think kind of like the comment section on blogs of your belief system, because we only, t- we only had out of our 60 guests, one negative guest, every guest that we met was so like-minded and mm-hmm. positive and mm-hmm. great. And everyone that we told that was close minded, they, um, that we did Airbnb were like, Oh my God, aren't you scared that some ax murderer is going to come into your house? Like everyone always went to murder. <laughs> <laughs> well, you go straight to the top, go to murder. Yeah, why not? And, and that was something that was just shocking to me is that every close minded person that we knew, when we told them we did Airbnb, they just went to the worst case scenarios they could think of. Oh, well, what if this uh, you a murderer comes to your home, or what if this happens, yeah. or what if a rapist? And it was just crazy bring, bring because, yeah. <laughs> because out of our over 60 guests from all over the world, you know, many countries all over. We only had one guest that we had an issue with. And I think that's a very good percentage. Um, yeah. So I think that, you know, the internet is a good way to kind of see your consciousness level um, because yeah. people will reveal what they're thinking. <laughs> Apparently a lot of negative people are thinking sure, of murder. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, in the internet, it's like, so this is another thing everybody needs to think about. And that is the internet has created a lot of multi-billion dollar companies and very, very wealthy people over the past 20 years, right? Facebook, Google, whatever. So everybody should think about leveraging the internet by having their own website. You know, it can be simply yourname.com, but you want to have this platform, no matter how small it is, so that when someone Googles your name or your brand, your site is going to show up, right? Not Google, uh, sorry, not Google, not, not Facebook, not LinkedIn, not Twitter. You want to own your brand online so you can build your own platform online. And from there, you can attract people, like-minded people that you care about, that you want to deal with and you want to work with. So many consulting opportunities, job opportunities, advertising opportunities all come from building your own brand online. So if everybody has something to do for before they go out on summer vacation or whatever, start your own website. It's a no-brainer. It's so easy and it's so cheap. That's true. And leverage is a good a good concept, too, because you're accessing billions of people, not millions online, you know, and there's so many creative ways to make money. I think there was a kid who made a million dollars, you know, um, I don't know if you saw this by selling um, advertising on his website. And he's it was mm-hmm. like a it was kind of like one of those stunts, the pixels. The pixels yeah, yeah, the pixels. Oh, yeah. Um, so he sold like a million pixels, one each for a dollar. And just not just that, oh, yeah. but there's so many other opportunities where you can just leverage. And, you know, whereas if you're just in your small town, for example, and you pay $40 to have an ad in the paper or somewhere locally, that $40 is not going very far. Maybe 10 people are going to walk by and see that ad or read a newspaper and see that ad. And now you have, you know, 4 billion people that are could possibly see your ad or whatever. You can compete with Facebook.com if you want and just go and create your own website. I mean, the, the, the whole idea is you've got to create that platform and you've got to try. Because if you don't try, nothing's going to happen. I mean, it took like a year of trying on FinancialSamurai.com in 2009 before I got my, you know, quote, big break, which was being mentioned in the LA Times for an article I wrote called um, Get an Umbrella Policy Because Your Teenager Will Bankrupt You. <laughs> okay. And then... <laughs> From there, you know, it was like LA Times, and then, oh, you were mentioning LA Times, oh, Chicago Tribune, oh, Chicago Tribune, and it just kept on going. But there's like this virtuous cycle that happens to you if you keep on going. And I think too many people give up before they see the flowers bloom. Hmm. 
Um, so are you done with your Uber project? You are just simply consulting or, or. Oh, so, so Uber was a great experiment. Like I didn't mean to drive for Uber, but I had like this, Oh, Oh, sign up and get a free gas card. Then $500. I was like, oh, okay, fine. But then I got really into it because I was listening to a lot of passenger stories from the people who, who woke up to go open up shop at 6 a.m. at Dick's Sporting Goods. I really kind of connected with them because it reminded me exactly of McDonald's time period. You know, to the moms who put their kids to sleep after 9.30 p.m. and they would drive for another two, three hours. Um, I really enjoyed it, but then I started not enjoying it when they started really cutting rates and really treating other drivers who relied on it as a full-time job kind of poorly. So I've stopped, and I, I, I always have this goal. If I'm going to start something, I'm going to try to achieve something, like a specific goal. So my goal was to achieve – was to basically last six months or reach 500 rides. And so I basically kind of did both. And um, now I just pick up people. If I'm going on the way somewhere anyway, I'll put on the app. And this is like a side hustle thing, right? I'll put on the app and the algorithm – and I'll put in my destination, and the algorithm will pick up. Uh, passengers who are on the way to your same destination. So, so you'll, just pick a, you'll just pick someone up on the way that somewhere you're driving anyway, make a couple extra bucks. Exactly. So if I'm going to go pick up my parents at the airport, why not make another 23 bucks picking someone else to drop them off at the airport, right? Yeah. It's like, no, that's like no brainer. So these, <laughs> these, these are like the little, little things that uh, anybody can do if well, they have a car, right? And it's just whether you want to do it or not and, and spend the time and pain in the ass to do it is a different question. And that's like, no, you know, someone who's complaining that they want the work-life balance and they only want to do the 40 hours. Well, that's something they were going to do anyway. So it's like add another hour on the clock, but you were going to do that anyway. Yeah. And it's really not another hour. It might be another 10 minutes because it's on the way. And so if you can think about doing things that you're going to do anyway, um, that's a win-win. So like, for example, I'm going to go to Paris for two weeks because I want to go watch the French Open because I'm a really big tennis fan. But I'm also going to go Paris because I want to meet some readers and do some investigative journalism on <laughs> you know, the lifestyles of the Europeans and why they're consistently so happy in all the world's happiest countries polls. Like every year, right? Europeans are ranked number one. And I want to talk to people about what, how they view happiness, life, and money. And so I want to go there anyway to see tennis so you know as a business owner how am i going to write about the happiness of europeans and if i don't if i don't, I don't go there and then therefore hey maybe it's a business expense who knows right <laughs> these are the things you have to think about all the time so you're getting triple value from your paris paris trip yeah so you know, think about at least double value in whatever you do and then you'll be really excited to do it more often first of all i can tell you without you doing any research it's just because europe is awesome <laughs> I went oh, there. Yeah. I went there on my honeymoon and just walking around. You just feel you just feel happy. Everyone looks happy. Everyone's sitting in an outdoor outdoor cafe enjoying life. You're like, this is great. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, taxes are high. Unemployment is high. But if you're happy, well, isn't that the bottom line? <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we start to wrap up, I want to talk about early retirement um, mm. because I am three years away from my early retirement. I'm very, very excited. Oh, and nice. I, my husband and I get a lot of pushback from people saying that we're crazy. <laughs> um, sure. And I've noticed um, that you talk a lot about, you know, that. And are have you had any negative experiences leaving the workforce? Or is it, you know, what are the, pro, uh, the pros of this early retirement? This financial independence. Oh, I have, I have, I have, I have so many posts, introspective posts on how it feels to be retired early, how it feels to be financially independent, and how it's actually really hard to get there. Like, I bet once you're, you know, three years from now, I bet you're gonna think to yourself, oh, just one more year, just one more year, and maybe I can save a little bit more or do whatever. There's all this interesting stuff that that happens. You mean once, once we're, you, you mean once we're ready to retire early our brain will try to trick us to yeah. keep working. Is that what I'm hearing? Exactly. <laughs> okay. it's, it's, the, it's the one more year syndrome. <laughs> it's funny that you say in three years, because I have actually already been thinking of about it now, because I, as I said about your blog, I like that you put hard numbers. So when I do my calculations, uh, when we do our budgeting and stuff like that, I'm always like, oh, well, if we, we return four years, then I'll have this extra, you know, $80,000. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm already doing the one more year thing, which is bad. <laughs> exactly. It's an inevitability. So just accept it, embrace it. Um, but I think there's something 
that I, I discovered. One is it, uh, early retirement is really lonely when you retire early um, because most peers are actually still working. That's right? one of our big concerns, so, actually. So we... my first year and a half, I kind of worked from above. Yeah, I said that's actually one of our, our concerns um, because we are like, oh, who, what are we going to do? So, I mean, it is a big concern. Uh, maybe 10 a.m. and then I'd go you know, with the tennis moms at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco for like three hours. Like literally, I play with like 60 year old guys, 70 year old guys, and we just <laughs> talk about life and stupid, stupid. Stuff. And I would like pass out and you know. Do wake you, up in do the you tell bar. them? Do you tell them, Sam, that you're that you're retired, or do you say I have a business yeah, that I work? Some of them. It depends on who I speak to, right? So if I speak to someone who's unemployed, I'll say I'm unemployed. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, I just, you know, it's like, I don't want to feel, make them feel bad that they're unemployed. If I speak to an early retiree, I'll be like, oh yeah, I'm an early retiree. <laughs> and if I speak to someone who is a blogger or entrepreneur, I'll say, oh yeah, I have an entrepreneurial endeavor. Because even mentioning it, we get so much negativity. Like we've been telling people for several years, yeah, we're going to retire in a few years. And there's like this negativity, bubbles, scoffing, like, oh, okay, Ooh. yeah, really, you're yeah, right. Because, you know, I'm only 32. Um, yeah. So we have we're trying to like make up elaborate lies. Like, should we tell people we have our own business and then we just have flexible hours? Like, what should we tell them? Because it just seems like even, you know, getting up to that point has been so much. Um, yeah, like just weird energy and angry, angry energy. Or even when we tell people our financial plan, they, well, how are you going to retire early? And we tell them about our, um, you know, what we've been doing and the, the investing and other things and. It's just like, oh, you can't do that. You know, I hear that. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, I mean, I guess one is you can just say you're podcasting, right? What's wrong with that? Oh, I make bajillions of dollars in your podcast. <laughs> you should say that. It's like, oh, podcasting is so amazingly lucrative. And oh my gosh, I'm going to the spa the other, you know, tomorrow night and I'm going to do some podcasting there. You can make poke fun of it. But podcasting is a legit career and it's a legit thing you can do in early retirement. But I think um, definitely the negativity stems from, uh, frankly, it's jealousy that, shit, I can't retire early, as early as you. Damn you. I don't want you to retire early, right? <laughs> it's pretty simple. Um, it, it, early retirement is is just a construct. that It's just words. You know, you're not going to do nothing. There's so much to do every single day. You're basically going to do everything that you've always wanted to really do all the time. So you optimize your time for happiness and you know, Financial Samurai might be a personal finance blog, but I think really it's a happiness blog and how we utilize money and time for maximizing our happiness. Yes, I totally agree. Um, well, um, any plans for the future as far as other books or other, I know you've been blogging and, and you said you're done with your Uber, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's just going to be a different journey, right? So, you know, as I reached mid middle age at 40, I'm going to have middle aged things to talk about. I already started talking about my midlife crisis fund and my midlife crisis cars to buy. And I think it's just going to be a fun journey just to follow along, you know, through the decades until I die, I guess. And that's the one of the most satisfying things is, you know, when you kind of, a lot of people, oh, that's the other thing. Like when, when you retire early, you kind of, you might get a little depressed or lonely. You're like, well, shit, where's my purpose in life? But um, I guess with blogging or just, doing anything online, you can connect with so many people that a lot of people worry about their legacy and, you know, what can they contribute to society. So actually doing something online and helping people is actually a really, really rewarding thing. So I just plan to continue to do what I'm doing. Maybe I'll re, re, restart a podcast. I don't know. Podcasting is so much work. <laughs> um, but who knows? Um, yes, I, th you know, I think that there is an online community, though, of early retirees. The problem is usually when people say early retiree, they mean 50s. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think there's a, yeah. a, a younger group kind of emerging. Do you feel that you don't feel that you've had more time to contemplate your purpose because you're not in that nine to five daily grind? Oh, I, th I think so. I mean, I think I found the purpose and that is... Um, to, continue, to continue writing, sharing a story, and helping people individually. And, you know, the great thing about FinancialSamurai.com and most sites is that it's free, you know. And and it's a, it's a it's not a push, it's a pull. So you, you decide whether you want to 
uh, improve on your financial situation and your happiness and your freedom. Um, I think for retirement, you know, so we know that money, there's always one extra dollar to make. I have friends who are poor and I have friends who are like ridiculously wealthy and their, their thoughts on money are all the same. It's kind of like the super rich guy who's worth a hundred million dollars looks at the billionaire. He's like, Oh, I wish I was a billionaire. It's an endless thing, money to desire. And it's really dangerous. So you've got to really figure out, hopefully everybody can figure out how much is it that they want to make a year and how much is it enough to be happy and how much wealth do they want? Because sooner or later we're all going to die. So you might as well retire by a certain age than, than by a certain financial figure, I think. Really kind of focus on your age because we live, most of us live in America and it's like, again, America is paradise compared to so many other countries around the world. That is so true. And there's so many opportunities here. And despite the fact that people complain about the government being repressive, as repressive as they may feel America is, it's way less repressive than like the majority of the other countries out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So go get out there and go travel and see the world and, uh, and then come back and be like, oh, America is awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, everyone check out financialsamurai.com. And if you're thinking of engineering your own layoff, you can check out Sam's book, which is available on financialsamurai.com. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, Well, we look forward to seeing what type of purposeful and amazing blog entries you have in the future. And thank you so much, Sam. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd love to talk to you again if you want. Yeah. If we're in San Francisco, we'll come visit you. Okay. Sounds good. All right. This has been Out of the Box Podcast with Rosie Tran. Out of the Box is sponsored by HugMeTees.com. Spread love. Give a hug. HugMeTees.com. Guys, we are now on SoundCloud. Go to SoundCloud.com slash Out of the Box Podcast and follow us. You can also go on Stitcher and iTunes. And as always, if you go on iTunes, don't forget to look for Out of the Box Podcast and leave a positive comment. Positive comments are the number one thing that help podcasts out. And if you have already left a positive comment, you can share the podcast with a friend, which um, helps us out so much more. So this has been Out of the Box Podcast with Rosie Tran. You can follow me on Twitter at Funny Rosie. Have a great day, guys. 